job on a letter and prayer for Paul and Timothy to the Philippians. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you. Because of your sharing the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the end, by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The light shines in darkness. Second reading comes from Matthew, the tenth chapter. Whoever welcomes a prophet in my name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, None of these will lose their reward. The light shines in the darkness. Good evening. Group of people, and I'm pretty sure if I were to talk this way 
you would tell me that I was missing the way family life actually works. Family will always frustrate you if you approach it as a consumer who is trying to get something back from it. Family is something you give yourself to. And it's in the giving that the gift comes. It comes when you're not looking for it. It sneaks up on you the first time a baby smiles at you when you think of a gift to give your dad or mom that makes them cry. Or after being married for decades, you tell your wife in the most loving way that she looks the same to you now as she did 25 years ago. And you wait for her to say the same thing back to you, and she doesn't, <laughs> because she loves you deeply, but she also loves the truth. And that's part of what you love about her. It's in the giving that the gift comes. So we move into our third week of the walk. We've looked at worship and our prayer life. We've looked at paying attention through Holy Scripture and how God is speaking to us through God's Spirit. And this week, the third practice in our walk with God is serving. Serving. Working for the well-being of others. And we're focusing together on what it means to belong to God's family here on this earth. If you follow Jesus, God doesn't call you just to go to church. God calls you to be church. And those are two very different things. To be church. To serve. To serve God's family. So when we leave the church on Sunday morning, what do we usually say? Go in peace. Serve the Lord. And then we all say resoundingly, thanks be to God. Go in peace and serve. That is what it is to be the church. So I want to share with you some texts. There are well over a thousand times in Scripture that the word servant or served is used, but there is one worth pointing out, and it's in Philippians, right at the very beginning of Paul's letter. Paul and Timothy. Servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the bishops and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. And all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. So we have that little word, joy. I always pray with joy, Paul says, always. Because of your partnership in the gospel, from the first day until now, the Apostle Paul indicates this. And there's a surprising truth about the joyful life that is kind of hidden in the very first line that Paul gives to the church in Philippi. Now generally, in the ancient world, letters began with a really simple formula. Kind of like in our day, we just start our letters saying, Dear whoever we're writing to, right? So, um, in the ancient world, they would start a letter from X to wherever it was being written to, greetings. So, when Paul, the apostle, wrote, uh, he most often included a little title that belonged to him. Guess what it was? Apostle. 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 So, uh, like to the church of Ephesus in Ephesians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Or to the Timothy, the second letter, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. Or to Corinth, in Corinthians, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. But in this letter, to Philippi, he used a very different word to describe himself. I want you to notice that Paul and Timothy servants servants of Christ Jesus. Not apostle this time, but servants. So why does he describe himself as a servant in this letter and not the other letters? Well, Philippi was a very elite community. It was actually a colony of the Roman Empire. And historians say Rome was the most status-conscious status, -conscious, status 
society in the ancient world. And Philippi was kind of an outpost, but it was a Roman colony. So if you were a citizen of Philippi, you were actually a citizen of Rome. And it was maybe the most status-conscious community in the entire empire. It was built on the pursuit of self-advancement. It was built on the pursuit of honor and stuff like that. So in Philippi, the way to be happy was to be self-fulfilled. It was to climb the ladder of success, as so often we say. So Paul starts with uh, the Philippians by using a word nobody in the Roman Empire would ever use to describe themselves. A servant. A servant of somebody else. Literally, he uses the word for slave. Slave. So he goes as far down the ladder as you can go. He says, I am not the master of a pleasant life or the ruler of a successful life. I am the servant of a great cause. And I am praying with joy, rejoicing for all of you. Paul wants them to experience and to know joy. Well, here is the paradox about joy. Here is the thing about happiness. I will never be happy if my ultimate goal in life is to be happy. You will never be happy if the ultimate goal for your life is for you to be happy. Happy is one of those things that comes only as a byproduct when you're pursuing something else. When you are pursuing something bigger or something better. There, it turns out, something that's way more important and more significant and better than a happy life. And that's what might be called a meaningful life. Not just a happy life, but a meaningful life. And as it turns out, happiness without meaning actually becomes very shallow and extremely self-centered. That's why it doesn't ultimately pay off. Sometimes we think I'll be happy if things go well. Sometimes we think I'll be happy if my needs are met. I'll be happy if my desires are satisfied. I'll be happy if I can avoid pain, and I'll be happy if everybody likes me. How does happiness come? Well, Scripture tells us, but I would like someone who I have found to be living out Scripture tell us. Julie Brent is a member here at Grace, and she has been on Facebook with what she calls the happiness challenge. So um, I asked Julie, um, knowing that not all of you are on Facebook, right? Some of you probably are on Facebook, but not all of you. I asked if she would come and speak to us tonight about how she's living out this happiness challenge. So Julie, you want to come forward. Julie is married to Kevin. Kevin, would you stand so people can see you? Um, <laughs> Your wife, that she uh, looks as beautiful as she did the first day she was married, uh, right? And uh, they both have uh, three children, Grant, who is uh, a freshman at Bethel College, and then uh, Kaylee and Kate, I believe, uh, fifth and fourth grade, am I correct about that? Third. Fifth and third grade. So here is our friend, Julie, to talk to us about how it is. Well, thank you. So, when Pastor Kendall messaged me wondering if I'd be willing to share my experience with my happiness challenge, I actually thought that it was going to be in front of this book club. <laughs> so, I replied to him, I'm not very good at talking in front of the group, but I'll face my fears for this. What time is your book club? <laughs> to my surprise, he replied, we're 
putting it on my Facebook is to show others that sharing happiness is something that can be easy and natural in our everyday life. The funny thing is that by sharing happiness with others brings you happiness as well. I'm finding that after 12 days of intentionally sharing happiness and thinking each day what I can do next is bringing so much more joy to my own life and also showing my family that sharing happiness and kind acts is fun and rewarding. They have joined me in on this journey. So to give you an idea of what I've been doing to share happiness with others on a daily basis are things that do not have to cost money and are simple. Things such as saying hi, waving intentionally to people, or looking at others in the eyes and saying good morning with a smile on your face. How about helping your neighbor, bringing them some goodies, or bake a cake for a friend or a group of teachers at school. Visiting the nursing home or sending flowers to someone just out of the blue. A simple note, handwritten and mailed. An email or a private message to tell somebody how much they mean to you and how thankful you are for them being part of your life. On Sunday, when it was beautiful out, I took a walk and intentionally stopped to talk to whoever I saw. This brought me joy and happiness, and I believe that they felt it as well. A few other things that I've done on this journey is giving my kids' teachers a gift card for a simple cup of coffee or latte at the local coffee shop. I put quarters in the shopping carts at all these, so when people came to shop, they didn't have to dig for their own quarters. And the other day, I went for lunch with the father of my best friend who passed away nine years ago. We've made it a yearly tradition to celebrate her life this way. My intention? To buy his lunch. But he wasn't having that, and he bought mine. We both felt so much gratitude that day. As it states in the book, it is not happiness that makes us grateful, it's gratefulness that makes us happy. So I invite and encourage all of you to join me in this happiness challenge, to walk with Christ and serve the Lord by serving others. Make it a, let's make it a habit to share happiness and kindness on a daily basis. You might be surprised as to how your mood changes and the feeling of happiness overtakes you. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So know that God created you to serve. That God gifted you to serve, that God called you to serve, and that God changes you when you serve. And it doesn't have to be big things. That's why Jesus said, even if you give a cup of cold water to someone, you shall not lose the reward. It can be simple things. And if you uh, are looking for a list of simple things, Emily put together a little uh, bookmark for you today. Uh, there's one for adults that adults can do very simple things. There's even one for kids that can do to share happiness so that you get the return of joy when you serve somebody else. So I was just thinking about this. And um, so if we were to serve, and the book challenges to, to do five things a week. To do five things a week. So last week we had 135 people here in attendance for worship. So if everybody did five things, we've got to be 675 acts of kindness just in one week. And if we made it a practice, if we did it 21 uh, days, I can't do the math right now, out of my head, but if we did 52, if we did it every week, that would be 35,100 acts of kindness just from you. Just from you in this room. And think of how that would change the world. I want to share with you just one more slide for you to think about. And uh, this is also from um, this is also from uh, Corinthians. Paul writes, just as a body though one has many parts but all its many parts form one body, so it is with, and you would think he would say the church. <laughs> he doesn't say the church. What does he say? Christ. This is Christ. So that your service to others is actually Christ. This is the hands and the feet of Christ active in the world. So let's commit to this and change 
the world. 